Uh, so again, once again, after this lecture, we have a discussion session, uh, 345 uh, with Iris and with Alex. Um, so the algorithm this time, I'm, I'm sticking with the birthday theme. So I'm going to split you up based on the last digit of your birth date. That's the day of the month uh, of your birthday. So if it's between one and five, you go to room E. If it's between six and zero, you go to room U. Okay. Once again, that'll be, you, you stay in the same room the whole time and the uh, two lecturers will switch part way through. Oh, okay. And so do we, how do we lecturers figure out which room we go to first? Uh, I think Alex has a has been using room E pretty frequently, so uh, I'll ask you to start in room U. Okay. And then I, I think one of us will be around to, to remind you when to switch. All right. Okay. And with that, okay. I'll uh, let Iris begin. Okay. Hello, everybody again. So, uh, to connect where we left off uh, at uh, yesterday, uh, I was introducing various uh, precision observables related to uh, the Z boson. They have to do with the cross-section and decay width and the symmetries and so on and so forth. And you already asked a number of questions in that direction and at the end I did confirm that really these are not truly observables but they are so-called pseudo-observables and what we would consider what we would consider to be a true observable needs to take into account additional effects. Some of them I alluded to last time already. So there is initial state radiation, which refers to, in this case, photons, color for that plot, which refers to photons being radiated in the initial state. So this blob contains whatever we are really interested in. In our case, it would contain the Z boson and any radiative corrections to its uh, couplings. And uh, the photon is radiated off one of the incoming external legs. Uh, there would be also corresponding virtual corrections. In principle, one needs to take both of them into account uh, so that uh, formally infrared divergences cancel. But <clears throat> they are still quote unquote collinear divergences that don't cancel, they are not really divergences because they are regulated by the electron mass, but they produce large corrections. So for single photon radiation, these corrections are proportional to two alpha divided by pi. So alpha divided by pi is something we typically get as a prefactor when we do QED corrections. But then the important part is that there's a logarithm of the center of mass energy divided by the electron mass. And if for the center of mass energy, we plug in the Z boson mass, this comes out to be roughly on the order of 11%. So for electro recorrections, that is a large correction. The way this is practically taken into account is by doing a so-called convolution so the cross-section for the full process would be given by some integral times a function which we may call a radiator function or structure function or something like that. And then use red for that. Something that I may call the deconvoluted cross-section or sometimes also called the hard cross-section. So this is, I'm using red to indicate that this is basically this deconvoluted cross section is what is in this shaded blob, the red blob. Because when a photon is being radiated in initial state, it carries away energy, 
the center of mass energy for this deconvoluted cross section is lower than S, right? So that's where the, why there's a one minus X piece in there. X is basically the fraction of energy that is carried away by the photon. So the integral goes from zero, in case it's an arbitrary soft photon, up to uh, the maximum energy that is available. And some energy has to go into producing the final state fermions, right? So it needs to be subtracted, uh, but otherwise it would go all the way to the maximum. If we want to sketch what is the effect of this initial state radiation, so let's sketch the cross section as a function of center of mass. The deconvoluted cross section I've drawn earlier that basically has this bright weakness shape. So it's a symmetric bell curve. The subscript F uh, just refers to the fermions that are produced in a final state. Uh, but once we take into account initial state radiation, this changes in a number of ways. So the new curve actually will have a smaller peak. It's not as high as before. The peak is also shifted uh, to the right, to higher energies, right? Because if you want to produce a Z-boson on shell, some of the energy already goes to the photons. Uh, so you have to have overall more energy in your collision in order to make the Z-boson. So it's shifted, it's uh, smaller the peak, and it also becomes asymmetric. So a bunch of different uh, effects that happen. It looks pretty dramatic, but um, this is something one can deal with though, because it is possible to compute this convolution function H fairly precisely. So not just from single, but also from multiple photon radiation. So if one does that, one gets a sum over powers of alpha, and one would also get a sum over powers of these logarithms. The factor two is included there kind of, you know, because it appears in the leading order. So we just keep doing that. And then there would be some coefficients which has to come out of a principal non-trivial calculation. So uh, at each given order of alpha, the leading correction that one gets, the so-called leading logarithms, occur for the largest value of m, which is m equals to n. So this is the maximum number of logs you can get. You can basically get one log per photon radiated. And these turn out to be universal. So for computing these, you don't need to know what is your deconvolute, what's your hard process, whether this involves Z boson production or something completely different. And they are actually known by now to pretty high order and equals six. The, uh, then there are also so-called subleading logs where M is smaller than the number of powers N. They also can be computed. Some of them are known, uh, but they then become process dependent. But for this particular process E plus E minus to two fermions, they have been computed as well. So there's a question, don't the collinear divergencies get absorbed by the electron PDFs? Uh, well, the answer to that is uh, actually no. So the situation at the lepton collider is different than at the hadron collider, right? So at the hadron collider, uh, we uh, basically cannot distinguish a process where we just get the partons from the protons, say quark and antiquark, or a process where an additional gluon is radiated in the initial state. There's no way to distinguish those in an observable way. So the only choice we have is absorbing those two different kinds of process all into the same thing. And we say, okay, you know, whether we get an extra gluon or not, this all comes from the same proton. Right? Proton in principle contains as many gluons as we wish. But for a lepton collider, that's not the case. We can actually distinguish those two things. 
because we know what is the energy of the incoming electron and positron. They are set by the accelerator layout. And if a photon is being radiated, that energy is reduced. So this is actually observably distinguishable. And uh, if it's something that's observably distinguishable, then this is something we also need to take into account in our predictions. And can you repeat why we are integrating over the convoluted sigma? So, okay, each time a photon gets radiated, it carries away some of the energy that is available in the collision. So the hard process, the process that actually produces the Z boson, if a photon is radiated, there's less energy available for doing that. So the center of mass for the deconvoluted process, what I call here, or the hard process is smaller. And uh, in order to account for that, we need to integrate. We need to integrate how likely, basically, is it that I get this center of mass energy or that center of mass energy or that center of mass energy in the hard process. And the function h gives us those probabilities. Oh, and somebody's asking what L is. Sorry, this is an abbreviation. This is this logarithm. Good, so uh, another issue we need to deal with are backgrounds. And this was kind of alluded to last time too. So backgrounds come basically from any physics process that looks indistinguishable in our detector, but uh, doesn't involve the Z boson that we are interested in. So it could come from photon exchange in the S channel it could come from other diagrams where we actually don't have a single particle in the S-channel. So for instance, it could be box diagrams like this. And the cross section for our entire um, process, this is now the process already after initial state radiation is removed, uh, would include all of those contributions. So there's a contribution that involves the Z boson, which is what we talked about last time. It's a contribution that involves photon exchange. And as a matter of fact, there's also interference between the two, right? If you square the matrix element, you can get Z times photon. So this is the gamma Z interference. And there would be also contribution coming from those box diagrams. The first one, the sigma z, is really what we are interested in for studying. So what is actually commonly done is that all the other pieces get subtracted. And one just uses the standard model prediction for subtracting what they are. Now, this may be a little bit concerning because if you think, okay, we are maybe trying to constrain new physics that involves the Z boson, right? The vertices of the Z boson. Well, those Z boson vertices would appear, obviously, also in this interference term, right? But we are using the standard model for computing what that is and subtracting it. So that's a little bit of concern indeed. Um, it's not completely crazy to do that because if we are on the z-pole, the cross-section for the z-boson exchange is much larger because it has a resonance, whereas the interference piece doesn't have a resonance. So the sigma z piece is probably on the order of a hundred times larger or something like that. So therefore, this is why typically one can get away without worrying about new physics contribution in this interference. Uh, but as an additional check, the lab collaborations also have performed some analysis where they try to estimate these backgrounds using a data-driven method, and they found consistent results. And then uh, I briefly want to mention a final piece without going into it, but of course for a realistic observable, one also needs to take into account that our detector is not perfect. So it can only measure particles in a certain range of angles. And uh, even within those angles, uh, sometimes it's better or less bad as identifying uh, 
which particles we have, what charge they have, and then there are cuts being applied to help with the uh, analysis. Uh, obviously, these are all things that need to be taken into account, and, but this is typically done using Monte Carlo tools rather than fixed order theoretical calculation. Good, so uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, one person is asking, H of X looks like the PDF of an electron. Um, well, uh, of course, for PDFs, you also have convolution formulas. So in that sense, it does look similar, but it is not really a PDF. Uh, there are no um, splitting functions technically being involved. Um, you also uh, would not compute uh, what the, you would not obtain basically your prediction for H of X from the renormalization group, but you would obtain it by computing specific matrix elements, basically. Uh, and as a, you know, for PDF, you wouldn't get collinear locks, right? They get redefined away, but here they explicitly do appear. Another question, why can't there be logarithms with powers larger than N? Well, so the logarithm comes from the fact that uh, if you integrate over the photon's phase space, uh, then the denominator of the electron propagator, so the, the one that is here, after the photon is being radiated and then connects with a hard matrix element, so that propagator becomes large when the photon is collinear with the electron, or positron in this case. Um, and if you perform that uh, phase space integration, you find uh, as a result of it, you get this logarithm. Uh, and so for each photon being radiated, you have one such propagator and therefore one logarithm. And another question, what about Higgs exchanges? Are they suppressed? Uh, you bet they are because uh, for the initial state, they couple to electrons and the Yukawa coupling for electrons is very small. So that's why we can ignore them. And why is gamma mediated interaction a background? Uh, why? Well, so we think we understand electromagnetism pretty well. And as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, there, there are measurements, you know, that study the coupling of photons to say electrons to amazing precision, including for instance, what I mentioned a little earlier, the electron magnetic moment. Uh, so we don't expect anything interesting to show up there in the coupling of photons to electrons or other fermions. Um, and therefore we are interested in really studying what happens for the Z boson because you know, we don't get 12 digit precision in the Z boson so far, so there's still room for surprises. All right, so, so far I've only talked about B e plus E minus colliders, but the name of the game these days are of course Hadron colliders, the LHC. And the question is what can we learn about these precision observables at the LHC? Turns out we can learn something uh, it's not terribly good at measuring total cross sections because it's hard to determine the total luminosity at the LHC with very high precision. So uh, it, it won't be able to become competitive with something like LAP on that front, but it can measure asymmetries much better. So to measure an asymmetry, involving the Z boson, we would look at production of leptons in the final state, uh, and actually particularly electrons and muons, because these are the things that can be identified with high fidelity at a Hadron Collider. Taus, bottom quarks, and so on, they are, they are lost in QCD background. Uh, so the relevant diagram for this would be where we have two incoming protons we take a quark from one and an anti-quark from the other. They make a Z boson and that decays into the leptons. And of course there's other crap from the protons that's left behind and that creates uh, some uh, rest of the event that's a little bit messy. 
So I was claiming one can measure a forward backward asymmetry, and I mentioned before it's defined forward is defined when the lepton, not the anti lepton, goes in a forward direction. That means in the direction of the incoming particle rather than anti particle. But in this context, this is not quite clear what that means because we actually do not have antiparticles in the initial state. We only have protons, no antiprotons. So this is a priori a symmetric initial state. And so this raises the questions, what actually do we mean by forward and backward in this context? But there's actually something we can do because quarks and antiquarks don't have the same role inside the proton. Quarks can be valence quarks if they are up and down, whereas antiquarks always have to come from the C, the QCD C. And therefore, on average, not in every individual collision, but on average, the quarks are more likely to carry a higher magnitude of momentum than the anti-quarks. Therefore, if we look at this collision in the lab frame, it would typically look like this. We have an ingoing quark and an ingoing anti-quark. The quark has a larger momentum. We don't really see those quarks, but we see the leptons that come out and because the incoming momentum has a net component pointing to the right in this picture, so must the outgoing momentum due to momentum conservation. So the whole event is one-sided. This example that I was drawing, it's pointing to the right overall. So this is what we get in the lab frame. Now, in order to make our analysis, we can boost to the center of mass frame. there, things would be symmetric. So the leptons are produced back to back. But we know in which direction we were boosting in order to get this. And we can use that information to define what's forward and what's backward. So we can basically say uh, the direction in which the overall event was pointing before we did this Lorentz transformation, that's what we call forward. So in the example I had for this event here, forward would be to the right, backward would be to the left. And so the angle theta in our case would be measured here between the forward direction and the L minus, the lepton, not the anti-lepton. And one can compute what one would get for an observable that's defined this way. And indeed, if there's parity violating Z couplings, one finds there is a non-zero forward backward asymmetry defined in this way. Now, there are still some problems one needs to deal with in this case. For instance, this procedure depends very sensitively on knowledge of the parton distribution functions. Because the PDFs tell us something about this statement that I made before here, right? That the quark momentum typically is larger than the anti-quark momentum, right? The PDFs gives us a distribution, a momentum distribution of the incoming quarks or anti-quarks. We need to know that very precisely if we want to do a precision measurement of the forward backward asymmetry. And the other thing is because we have quarks in the initial state, there are important QCD corrections that need to be taken into account. From diagrams of this sort, where you know, we have some number of gluons being exchange the initial state. This is actually known uh, now to the three loop level, 
at least for the total cross section. I'm not sure if the differential one has been computed yet. Definitely at the two loop level, the differential one is known. Okay, let's look at a few more questions. Um, so one question, it seems that the three body is suppressed by a four pi factor. Um, yeah, I mean the, the four got absorbed by some other factors that appear, but you still see the pi here in the denominator. So that is there indeed. Uh, why is it still a large correction? It's because of the logarithm, right? Two alpha divided by pi uh, is something that is uh, less than 1%, right? It's less than half a percent even. Um, so that's a fairly small number, but the logarithm is large enough to still make this a large correction. Um, and the question, will the PDF uncertainty give rise to a larger uncertainty to AFB at the LHC compared with lepton colliders? Yeah, so you wouldn't know that exactly until you try to do your best. Um, so right now, as a matter of fact, uh, the most precise analysis for a single experiment at the Hadron Collider is from Atlas. And the precision they get from there is not quite as good as what one gets from uh, a single experiment at the E plus E minus Collider, but almost. So within, you know, within less than a factor of two. Um, the experiments at E plus E minus were statistics limited. So if one combines all lab experiments together, they are still quite a bit better than what the LHC can do. Uh, the LHC statistics is not a problem. Uh, it's systematics limited in particular by the PDFs. And they still think though they can improve the PDFs further to what we know today and uh, basically match the precision that was achieved at, at lab. But this remains to be seen. All right, so I've talked a lot about Z bosons. Uh, for W bosons, there is so far not so much in terms of precision observables, except for one that is commonly used, which is the mass of a W boson. Now, you may wonder why is the mass of the W boson not in my previous list of precision observables that are called inputs, right? I had all the other masses there. The Z boson mass was there, the top quark mass was there and so forth. Why is the W boson mass not there? And the reason for that is that as a matter of fact, we can compute it from other inputs that we have already. And in particular, the crucial piece that allows us to do that is the Fermi constant from muon decay. So let me write down once more how this Fermi constant is related to other parameters in the standard model. I write it in a slightly different way than before, where on the left hand side, instead of G squared, I write that now in terms of alpha, the phi structure constant and the weak mixing angle. This would be the tree level relation and then there are those additional corrections in delta R. And uh, now we could try to uh, solve this equation for MW. When we do that, we need to take into account that the weak mixing angle also depends on MW. It was one minus MW squared minus MZ squared. So it's actually a quadratic equation we have to solve. The answer looks like this. So square root with all the other parameters that appear in our formula. And then there's this radiative correction term. This is the formula that we get 
And so if we measure G mu, MZ, alpha, and so forth with high precision, and they are known with high precision, then we can actually predict the W mass with very high precision. Um, it's actually just a tad bit more complicated because uh, inside these loop corrections that we compute here, there are of course all kinds of other stuff that can appear as well, right? There can be Higgs bosons in the loops, there can be top quarks in the loops, there can also be more W bosons in the loops. So delta R is actually a function of all those parameters. And they need to be taken into account in particular because MW appears there, but we want to solve for MW, we really need to solve this equation in an iterative way, right? So we make a first guess what MW is and then we plug it in and plug it in and plug it in and finally it converges. So this is how we could get a theory prediction for MW and then we can compare that to direct measurements And currently the most precise direct measurement comes from Hadron colliders, not from lepton colliders. And this is again owed to the fact that the statistics at the Hadron collider are much better than at the lepton colliders we had so far for this purpose. And the relevant process for this looks very similar to the one we just had for Z bosons. So we also take a quark and anti-quark pair and this can make a W boson, W minus or W plus depending what quarks we had in the initial state. Let's just assume it's W minus for now and then this decays and in order to be able to dig out this decay products from the background we again have to insist on only leptonic decays. So electron muon in the final state this is the only way you can really do this. You can observe it also for quarks in the final state. So it's visible, but not with, with very good precision. Now with the W boson, the situation is experimentally a bit more complicated because uh, you can not actually measure the neutrino in the final state. So that's different than from the Z boson. We only see one lepton and then we see some momentum imbalance. But at a Hadron Collider, you don't really know what is the total momentum of the incoming quark and anti-quark. So you cannot use momentum conservation to exactly reconstruct what's the momentum of the neutrino, then reconstruct what's the invariant mass of the neutrino lepton pair and from that get the W mass, right? So that's not possible. Um, <coughs> So new L, sorry, the momentum of new L is unknown. The one thing that you know is um, its transverse part. This is relevant for the pre-spatial components. Transverse part, so that's the part that's perpendicular to the incoming beam line, right? Because you know the beams don't have any transverse component, it's not a significant part. So you know the initial momentum in the transverse direction and therefore there you can use uh, momentum conservation in order to get a transverse part of the neutrino. And so instead of um, constructing the invariant mass of the lepton and neutrino, you can construct something that's the next, next best thing, which is a so-called transverse mass. You just use the transverse components of the momenta to construct it. And um, this transverse mass does not have a peak at exactly the W mass, but it has a shape that is directly related to the W mass and you know I have some more details in the lecture notes about this but because today I still want to get to the constraints to new physics I will go over this uh, rather quickly. <clears throat> 
the con systematically most precise way to measure the W mass at E plus E minus colliders uh, would be similar to what we discussed for the top quark. And this is an opportunity for, in particular for future E plus E minus colliders that are planned to have much higher luminosity than lab had. So they can do that actually very well. So what you would do for that is you look at the cross section for W pair production and you do this near the threshold where this process opens up. So at a center of mass energy of roughly two times the W mass. And so the cross section would be rising quickly there. And you measure at a few center of mass energies in order to determine this rapid rise. And this is something that uh, can be uh, theoretically predicted with very high fidelity. It's of course very hard if you include radiative corrections. You have to include both the production of the W bosons and their decay because these are particles which a large decay with. So you have to include those things. You know, if you remember last time, uh, field renormalization for uh, instable particles not really defined. You have to let it decay and include that. But okay, it's hard work, but in principle, if you assume you can just do those loop integrals, you get a very precise prediction for how the shape looks like and you can compare that to the experiment and you get a very precise result. So just to summarize this section, let me just make um, a table of a few examples of experimental measurements of some of these uh, precision observables. And as examples, I just picked the total decay width of the Z boson the leptonic effective weak mixing angle. If you remember, this is the quantity that was related to the ratio of the vector and axial vector couplings of the Z boson and the mass of the W boson. And today, all of these quantities are already fairly precisely known. So for the Z width, I actually told you that before already, this is measured with an uncertainty of 2.3 MeV. So this is roughly one per mil of its actual size. For the effective weak mixing angle, this is so well known that we have to use a multiplier of 10 to the minus five. So it's with an uncertainty of 13 times 10 to the minus five combining different inputs. And for the W boson mass, it's around 15 MeV. So they are very precisely known. And this gives us already very important constraints on new physics as we will see in a few minutes. But there are actually proposals for future E plus E minus colliders. And to a large extent, these future colliders are driven by the fact that they could study the newly discovered Higgs boson in great detail. But they could also do electroweak physics. Again, uh, there are some proposals where one would have a ring, E plus E minus ring accelerator, one in Europe called FCCEE, and one that is proposed to be hosted in China called CEPC. Um, and there is another competing proposal which wouldn't be a ring, but a linear collider called ILC, International Linear Collider. FCCEE and CPC, they are both in the current plan for seen to run on the Z pole again, as well as at the WW threshold to measure the W mass. For ILC, that is not really for, for seen to happen. It's supposed to run, the smallest center of mass energy that's supposed to run is, oops, not MEV, but 250 GeV. 
but it can also measure properties of the Z boson by producing the Z boson together with a photon, right? So you basically have large initial state radiation so that uh, after the photon carries away some energy, uh, you have the right energy to make a Z boson. And so all these machines, because they propose to have very high luminosity, they can measure these quantities to much better precision. So for the width, we have 0.1, for FCCEE, about 0.5 for CEPC. At the ILC, you don't have a very good handle on the width because uh, you know, the, what you would normally use as calibration for your energy is your beam energy. So if exactly your electron and positron make exactly a Z boson, you know what the energy is. But if some of the energy is carried away by the photon, you don't know that anymore. So you don't have a good handle to measure the width with very high precision. For the effective weak mixing angle, 0.5 for FCCE, something on the order of one or less for CAPC, and something on the order of two times 10 to minus five for ILC. And the W mass also is expected to be measured much better at any of these machines. So basically you see on the order of a magnitude or even more improvement that could be achieved. Good, so what, we, what can we do with that precision? Well, um, so first of all, um, in my lecture notes, I also have some more information about other experiments that work at much lower energies that can also give us interesting input on electric physics. I don't have enough time to go through that. So I will basically skip that, but maybe, you know, if you have questions about that in the discussion session, we can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, these are low energy scattering experiments or the muon G minus two experiments. At this point, I want to move ahead to my last chapter and talk about tests of the standard model and beyond the standard model physics. So let's first talk about the standard model. So what we do here is we take all these different precision observables that have been measured very precisely and we compare them to predictions that we get in the standard model. And we do this for all our different Position observables like the Z boson width, effective weak mixing angle, W mass, blah, 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 whatever we have. Now, since these are measured very precisely, this comparison only makes sense if our standard model prediction is at least equally precise. Fortunately, currently that is the case. So for any of these quantities that I've talked about, the standard model prediction is known, including full two loop corrections and some higher order QED and QCD corrections. As I mentioned, for the electron magnetic moment, the QED part is even known to five loops. In some cases, the QCD part is known to four loops. So, a lot of effort that went into this. One could have a whole set of lectures just about how these corrections are being computed. For the electroweak two loop part, it's also kind of interesting because the loop integrals you get there cannot be solved analytically. So you have to do something numerical and so on and so forth. At this point though, um, instead of discussing the full results for these corrections, I want to just point out a few 
uh, leading effects that one can get. Let me begin with uh, this relation that I now wrote down a couple of times between the Fermi constant and the W mass. We have introduced this delta R to describe all the corrections. So if you were actually trying to compute what this delta R is, the leading pieces, there are two leading pieces that are important. One is this delta alpha that we encountered earlier, which comes from the renormalization of the uh, charge, right? And you know, you remember it contained those logarithms of fermion masses and we needed to use some data for the quark part of that. So this delta alpha can be basically split up into two pieces, one for leptons in the self-energy diagrams that we need for the renormalization, and one for quarks in the self-energy diagrams. The leptonic part can be calculated perturbatively, reliably, because lepton masses are well-defined and well-measured. The part for quarks cannot be calculated because we don't really know what quark masses are supposed to be. Uh, and as I explained earlier, we have to use data to get this. And if you add those two pieces together, you get something that's on the order of 6%. And so for electroweak corrections, that's a fairly large effect. The next important piece is what is sometimes called the rho parameter. And it comes with some prefactor of cosine divided by sine of the weak mixing angle. And the rho parameter has, in principle, a number of different contributions. But in the standard model, the most important contribution comes from loops involving the top quark, coupling to the Z and W boson. And some of these loops are basically proportional to the top Yukawa coupling. So very precisely, this is the leading piece we get in terms of the top Yukawa coupling. And this is important because the top Yukawa coupling is one of the largest couplings in the standard model. It's roughly one. So it's uh, of roughly the same order as the strong coupling at this energy scale. There are also loops from other fermions but they are really negligible because their Yukawa couplings are much smaller. So it's really the top quark mass that's the important piece. And if we include this prefactor, cosine squared divided by sine squared, the correction we get from this is roughly on the order of 3%. So it's a little bit smaller than the delta alpha piece, but it's still relatively large. And then there's everything else, which I may call delta R remaining. So this delta R remaining is a little less than 1% all the other contributions, so that is smaller. And that includes things like any diagrams involving the Higgs boson, for instance. That's all in there. For other precision observables, we kind of get a similar picture. So if we want to describe what our standard model theory predicts for the effective weak mixing angle, at tree level, this would be identical to the on-shell weak mixing angle, the thing that's given through the W and Z boson passes. <clears throat> but then there can be corrections, which I will call delta kappa 
And the leading correction piece to this delta kappa turns out to be also this rho parameter. And the delta alpha doesn't appear here, but then we have some remainder again. And this remainder is also much smaller. Okay, somebody is asking, is this rho different from the ratio of mz squared divided by mw squared divided by cosine of the weak mixing angle, which is one at three level? Um, I think we are talking about the same thing. Uh, this relation that you are writing there, though, uh, would need to would need some clarification. the other way around. I think the cosine goes in the numerator, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Something like that. Uh, now, if you were to use on-shell masses and the on-shell weak mixing angle and you plug in the values, you see you would get exactly one to all orders, right? So that doesn't make, uh, so that's not what is meant by that for on-shell quantities. But there is some way to derive this row parameter in a different renormalization scheme, like MS bar use MS bar renormalization, then, you know, there's no direct relation between these three things that appear here. And then one can compute this row parameter this way. And one would get the same leading correction for the top quad loops. But, okay, because we are not using the MS bar scheme here, we won't be using it. And somebody else is asking, are those related to the STU parameters? Uh, one of them is. So this delta rho is actually related to the T parameter. There's actually also a reason why this delta rho correction related to the top u carver is relatively large. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm unfortunately not able to really spell this out but I have spelled it out in the lecture notes. And this is because the top Yukawa or any firm Yukawa, as a matter of fact, breaks a symmetry that exists in part of the standard model. This is a so-called custodial symmetry. Uh, it's a symmetry that exists in the Higgs potential. And uh, the Higgs potential, of course, you know, the Higgs field, you know, is a doublet under the SU2 weak interactions. So it needs to be invariant under the SU2 weak gauge transformations. But it turns out that the Higgs potential is invariant under a second SU2, which one can call a right-handed SU2. But the Yukawa couplings are not. And so therefore they break the symmetry. So I'm not able to spell it out here, but I, I hope that uh, my lecture notes are somewhat self-explanatory on this front. So YT in particular, or most precisely the fact that the top Yukawa is different from the bottom Yukawa, breaks the so-called custodial SU2. And anytime a symmetry gets broken, we can get potentially large corrections because for a broken symmetry, the decoupling theorem doesn't apply. And so this produced, this is the origin of why the corrections in delta rho are relatively large. And this is a nice feature that this is the case, because now if we compare what we compute for the W mass or for the weak mixing angle, if we compare those things to data, and we take into account this correction, which comes from the top you cover, and we have pretty good precision, then we are able to make an indirect determination 
of the top you cover or from that we can also get an indirect determination of the top quark mass right if we just multiply the top you cover by the VEF and what one gets by combining all these electroweak precision observables that we have discussed is this indirect prediction for the top quark mass 176.3 plus or minus 1.9 GV. So this is a little bit higher than what you would directly measure at the LHC that gives you something that's more like 173 GeV, but you know, within better than two sigma consistent. I have in the lecture notes also included some uh, plots, which I will not attempt to draw here by hand for more of these indirect constraints that you can get. Uh, you can also get uh, an indirect determination for example, for the Higgs boson mass. But that is much less precise than the one for the top quark mass. And the reason for that is that the Higgs contribution appears only in these relatively small pieces, the remainder pieces here. Uh, it, it's not enhanced in any particular way. It actually at leading order appears only in a logarithm and not as a power term. And so the Higgs boson mass can only be constrained with a precision of something like uh, 50 GeV or so. So much less precise than the top quark mass. Nevertheless, this was really important information before the Higgs boson was found by the LHC to give us some indication what should we expect for the Higgs, what the Higgs boson is. If the standard model is correct, we had before the start of the LHC already a prediction that the Higgs boson needs to be lighter than something like 160 GeV. And uh, the LHC would be guaranteed to find that. And it did. So now let's leave behind the standard model and check some other things. So one thing I may wonder about the standard model, and this is somewhat the theme of this TASI, this year's TASI overall, is that we really don't know that much about neutrinos yet. We don't know where they get the mass from. And in the standard model, there are three neutrinos uh, and they got put in, you know, because we know three charged leptons. But do we really know for sure that there are just three neutrinos or maybe more? So we can use electroweak precision data to get some constraint on that. For instance, we can look at the decay width of the Z boson. The Z boson can decay into anything that couples to it. So it decays into charged leptons. And uh, for each lepton, the contribution to the total width is roughly the same for electron muon tau. So we just multiply by three. It can decay into neutrinos. And well, I want to be a bit agnostic here and say, I don't know how many neutrinos there are. So I put just a number in front of it, a symbol. And then it can decay into quarks and those quarks will form hadrons. We saw that we can measure this total width over here by looking again, you know, at the line shape of the Z boson cross section at different center of mass energies and the width of this curve, that's where we get it from. So we know this. Um, now there's still a number of other pieces inside that formula. We can learn more about them by measuring something else. Like for instance, we can measure the cross section of E plus E minus going to a Z boson and then going to quarks or hadrons on the peak. And 
written down that formula before. This can be described as 12 pi divided by mz squared. The partial width of leptons or electrons that comes from the initial state. The partial width of z into hadrons. So that's the sum over all quarks divided by the total partial width squared. And if I take these two formulas and I combine them and I solve for the number of neutrinos, I get the following formula, 12 pi divided by mz squared, something that I call R sub L divided by this hadronic peak cross section so this R sub L is a branching ratio. It's defined as the width going into hadrons or quarks divided by the width going into one lepton. Square root of this minus again this R sub L minus three. And then I have the ratio of gamma L divided by gamma U. So this is just simple algebra from uh, the first two steps getting to this. And now the point is that a number of things here like the mass, the cross section, this branching ratio, these are all things we can actually measure from data. The only thing that we can't measure from data is this ratio over here, because we are not able to ind independently measure the decay of a Z boson into neutrinos. If the neutrinos are weakly interacting, they would fly out from the detector. So this is not an observable final state. Uh, therefore, for this ratio, we have to use a standard model calculation. But everything else we can get directly from data without any further assumptions. And if one does that, one gets for the number of neutrinos 2.996 plus or minus 0 0.007, which is an excellent agreement with three. Right? So this will indicate that there are are exactly three neutrinos that couple to the Z boson. There's a caveat though, because in computing, what the standard model predicts for this decay width of Z into neutrinos, this decay width depends on uh, what the mass of the neutrinos is. In the standard model, of course, we know the mass is very, very small, much smaller than one electron volt, practically negligible. Um, and if I use this for constraining the number of neutrinos, I'm implicitly assuming that any additional neutrino is also alive. So this is just an assumption that went into this, that the neutrino mass is much smaller than the Z boson mass. But that may or may not be the case. There are in fact various models with heavy neutrinos, but electric precision can also be used for that. And this comes from the same type of correction that we previously mentioned for that is used for constraining the top quark mass, this delta rho. So the delta rho, as you saw, involves Yukawa couplings. Uh, and if we had a heavy neutrino that gets its mass from electric symmetry breaking, it would also need to have a sizable Yukawa coupling and therefore it would get a correct producer correction to delta rho. More generally, if we really 
uh, we need to be a bit more specific where we think this extra neutrino is coming for. So let's just assume we have overall a fourth generation of fermions. So we have an additional lepton besides uh, electron mu tau, which are called L4. We have an additional neutrino. And maybe there are also additional quarks. But for our argument here, we don't need to bother with them. But the, the charged lepton and the neutrino, we kind of need to take together because they form the SU2 doublet. Right? And therefore, they couple to a W boson, for instance, both together. And so we can compute the correction we get to this delta rho from this fourth generation. The formula is slightly more lengthy than what I had before. involves both the Yukawa coupling of the charged lepton and of the neutrino. And there's a logarithm. So in principle, the structure of this formula is pretty much the same you would get for, say, a top and, top and bottom doublet. One difference is you get an extra factor three because of three colors. So that's what we saw in the formula I wrote down earlier. There's this factor three in front that comes from the number of colors. And then another thing I did at that point, I used the fact that the bottom you cover is much, much smaller than the top you cover. And so then basically the two last terms in this formula would disappear and you only have this top you cover term here. But now if we want to say something about a potential fourth generation, we don't know really what's the ratio of lepton and neutrino mass, so let's just keep it general. So this formula looks a little bit complicated, but uh, if one plays around with it a little bit, one can show that this whole expression is bounded from below by just the difference of these two Yukawa coupling squared. And the fact that uh, our various measurements agree pretty well with the standard model, so we can't have a large extra contribution to delta rho, therefore puts a constraint on this mass difference. So our electric precision data would impose a bound on this mass difference. It can not be any greater than 48 GeV. This is it. 90% confidence level. Well, okay, that only gives us a mass difference. Still, we can have these particles uh, as long as the masses are almost degenerate. But then we can use some other data to get an additional input. For instance, we can look at lab data. that constrains the existence of this charged lepton because a charged lepton is visible in the detector. It hasn't been seen. And therefore, any charged lepton with a mass of 101 GeV or less is excluded. The LHC is also searching for these. Right now, the constraints from LHC are not competitive with lab 2 but for the high lumen LHC, they will become competitive and the bound will get pushed out further. So if I combine these two constraints, 
I get a constraint that any fourth generation neutrino would have to be larger than about 50 GeV. Okay, that might not look so impressive, right? 50 GeV is not a particularly high mass scale, but you know, it's a constraint and we have to take whatever we get. In fact, one can improve this constraint by still taking in more data. One can look, for instance, at the Higgs to gamma gamma width that gets contributions from these extra leptons running in the loop that gives us more information and so on and so forth. So it's actually much more constrained than what I wrote down here, but these are the constraints we get from electric precision. So briefly at the end, I want to mention some other new physics scenario that we could also constrain related which are so-called sterile neutrinos. So in the previous section, I was assuming the neutrinos couple to Z and W bosons and to the Higgs bosons, just like the three neutrinos in the standard model do. Sterile neutrinos would not do that. Uh, they don't have any gauge couplings. That's why they are called that way. Sterile, um, but it is generally assumed that the sterile neutrinos can mix with the active neutrinos in the standard model. So let's introduce theta alpha for the mixing. Between hypothetical sterile neutrino and an active neutrino nu alpha. So alpha can be E u tau. And it's just this mixing angle that I basically need to know in order to use electric precision. Uh, where it's exactly coming from depends a little bit on the sterile neutrino model. I have one example in lecture notes. There are a few other examples you could consider. And this mixing would lead to modified predictions for the electric precision observables. For example, if I look at muon decay, it decays uh, into two neutrinos and then the electron. And so these two neutrinos would now mix with the sterile neutrino. If the sterile neutrino, um, let's give it the name capital M. So if its mass is greater than the mass of the muon, it cannot be produced in this decay only the active neutrinos can be produced. But because of the mixing, the active neutrinos have reduced couplings to the W boson that appears inside this box. And therefore, the relation for the Fermi constant gets modified. So this is the relation we would get in a standard model. Again, I wrote it in a slightly different way. Um, but now we get a reduction factor of one minus mixing angle squared for both the electron and the muon neutrino. So they basically just come from expanding sines, cosines or something like that. And uh, by actually comparing our knowledge of G mu and then W and so on and so forth, we can constrain those mixing angles from there. We can do something similar with Z boson physics. 
right? This E boson can decay into neutrinos. And as I discussed just a few minutes ago, this will affect the contribution to the total width of the Z boson that is invisible because the neutrinos are not being recorded in the detector. Again, assuming that the sterile neutrino is too heavy to be actually produced, what we get is a reduction in the decay rate into these neutrinos involving these mixing angles. Actually, if one wants to be fully general, of the mixing angles for different flavors can be different, so we can have two different uh, types of neutrinos even being produced here. And now, again, we can compare this to experiment, to the measurement of the total width, and so forth. And uh, there are a few more observables that we can use. And if we use all those comparisons, we get that for the electron and muon flavor, these are due to be con these are constrained to be less than oops, two times ten to the minus three. For tau, it's a little less precise. Seven times ten to the minus three. So this is what we get today. And if we have future A plus E minus colliders that I mentioned before, like for instance FCCEE, these limits can be improved quite a bit to the level of 10 to the minus 5. And in this mass range of sterile neutrinos, so we are talking about relatively heavy sterile neutrinos in this context here. These electroweak precision constraints are some of the strongest constraints that we actually have on them. For lower masses, there are other ways how one can test them better. But for heavy masses, this is kind of uh, a good handle to do that. So there would be many more examples of new physics that I could discuss that can be constrained from electroweak precision. Uh, also dark matter, which is another theme of this, uh, of this uh, school. Uh, could be constrained to some extent. Actually, typically the better handle is not necessarily on the dark matter particle directly, but on its mediator. So I have in the lecture notes another example, which is so-called dark photon. <coughs> the dark photon, if it exists, would modify the couplings of the Z boson to standard model fermions, and you get some, some constraints on that. The dark photon is a potential mediator to dark matter. And again, in a range of something like uh, around 100 GeV or so as a mass for the dark photon, some of the strongest constraints come from electric precision. There's also a more model independent way to put constraints on physics beyond the standard model in electric precision. It's by using an effective field theory description. Uh, this is something you will learn more about in the last week of the school in the lectures from Adam Martin. So I won't really talk about that here. Good, so I think my time is up. There's one more question in the chat. So let me just address that. Can we use the comparison between muon decay and the leptonic decay of tau in order to constrain the mixing angles? Uh, conceptually, absolutely, we can do that. The only problem is the decay rate of the tau is much less precisely known than the decay rate of the muon. The problem is the tau decays much faster, and so it's much harder to constrain its decay rate. Uh, in addition, uh, if we want to analyze the tau decay uh, theoretically, uh, it gets more complicated because the tau is heavy enough that it has a sizable branching fraction into hadrons. And if you want to learn something about the neutrinos and the leptons, you need to subtract this hadron piece, right, and then learn something about the rest. Uh, that gets a little bit messy, 
to predict that. Uh, so therefore, it's not it's not constraining enough to really play a role in this. Uh, the constraint we get that I wrote down over here on the tau mix, which basically comes from Z boson physics, is better. All right. Yeah, uh, this was fun. Uh, thank you all for listening, and we will see each other in 20 some minutes in the discussion session. All right, great. Thank you very much uh, for a wonderful set of lectures. So yeah, we'll uh, begin the discussion uh, in after a 20 minute break. Uh, so again, the, the algorithm for being sorted into your discussion room, E or Mu, is in the, uh, the Slack general channel. So uh, check that out and then join the discussion in 20 minutes or so.